In this week's video, we'll review charts dating back to 1926 to help us answer the question, is the bull market peaking now or just getting started? A quick reminder, there's a big difference between the utility of short-term timing signals and confirmation signals. The charts that follow are long-term, big picture confirmation charts. In last week's video, we used Bollinger Bands and the Bollinger Band Width to review monthly charts of the S&P 500. In this week's video, our primary focus will be on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and this time we'll be using quarterly charts with Bollinger Bands and the Bollinger Band Width. This is quarterly price here, the Dow. This is the Bollinger Band, and this is our Bollinger Band Width. This looks confusing, but these are just simply reference points. This is the upper Bollinger Band, this is the midline or center line, and this is the lower Bollinger Band. From roughly 1926 to 1954, the Dow Jones Industrial Average Quarterly Chart was in a consolidation period or a period of long-term indecisiveness or confusion. And we know from past videos that when the Bollinger Band width gets relatively low relative to looking backwards, it tells us that we have that sleepy, trendless market. And we can determine that basically by looking at price as well. On the quarterly chart at the end of the quarter on June 30th, 1954, we have the relatively low Bollinger Band width and we get what's known as a price thrust or a price surge where price closes on a quarterly basis above the upper Bollinger Band, which is a sign of strength. And we know the longer a market goes sideways, the bigger the move that we can expect to get. And therefore, based on this consolidation period, it's not particularly surprising that the harder market was followed by an easier market. And the Dow from point A here rallied for an additional 6,758 days and tacked on an additional 205%. Similar situation, if we were looking backwards in 1984, we have a long-term period of consolidation that dates all the way back to the 1960s. And when price breaks out of the box here, if we move down, if we look backwards, we have a relatively low Bollinger Band width when we look backwards. The width here is quite a bit lower than it was here, here, or here. And similar to the previous example, we get our price thrust, our surge. In this case, it happened on a quarterly basis, 12-31-1982. We get a quarterly close in here above the upper Bollinger Band. And then if we fast forward into 1984, we get somewhat of a retest here with price, where price comes back down, back towards the orange box and holds. So in the previous example, when we had consolidation, a relatively low Bollinger Band width, and a price thrust, good things happened. Similar situation here from point A, or when we get the first quarterly close above the upper Bollinger Band, above the orange box, after that, the Dow Jones Industrial Average tacked on an additional 998% over the next 17 years. If we fast forward to the present day, this chart is dated May 10th, 2018. We have a very similar situation. We have a multiple year consolidation period. When price breaks out of the box, when we look backwards, we have a relatively low Bollinger Band width here, when we break out, this level here is quite a bit lower than these levels back here. And in the present day case, our first quarterly close above the upper Bollinger Band occurs here, and it happens on December 31st, 2013. Now we're looking at the same three cases, but we're taking a big step back. So now we're looking at 1926 all the way out to the present day. In the first case, we have a long-term period of consolidation. In the second case, we have a long-term period of consolidation. In the third case, we have a long-term period of indecisiveness or consolidation. 
Back to the first case. When we break out from the box, we have a relatively low Bollinger Band width looking backwards. Second case, when we break out from the box, we have a relatively low Bollinger Band width looking backwards. And in the third case, when we break out from the box, we have a relatively low Bollinger Band width when we look backwards. Relative is the key term. In the first case, we had a price surge or a thrust with a close above the Bollinger Band. Get another quarterly close above the upper Bollinger Band here. In a similar situation here in 2013. In the second case, we came back and had somewhat of a retest look coming back towards the orange box. We have a similar situation in the present day example where price comes down here and if it wanted to, it could have re-entered the orange box, but it held and went on to print a higher high, but it held and went on to print a higher high. And in this case here, we get a second price surge in relatively short order. We're inside or below the upper Bollinger Band and then we get a quarterly close above. Similar situation here. We went back inside below the upper Bollinger Band and then subsequently saw a quarterly close or a surge above. In the first case, after we could see all of this, the market rallied for an additional 18 years and tacked on an additional 205%. In the second case, after we could see all of this, this is observable evidence the market tacked on an additional 998% over the next 17 years, telling us to keep an open mind about better than expected outcomes going forward. And as always, we're talking about probabilities based on hard evidence that we have in front of us today. We are not making a forecast. If you take the average between these two gains and you look at how far we've come since the price surge here in 2013. If the present day case was similar to this case and this case, basically falling right in the middle, in the present day, the Dow could rally for an additional, from the present day, from May 10th, 2018, an additional 13 years, and it could tack on an additional 377%. If we were to follow a similar path, a similar path, the Dow hypothetically would reach 116,000 in October of 2031. In the present day, the Dow is hovering around 24,000. It's extremely important from a psychological perspective. When we review historical charts, we have to understand if we were reviewing charts in 1954, or we were living and trading in 1954. We have no idea what the future looks like. All we know is what's in the rear view mirror. So it's very easy to understand that people were skeptical about this breakout in 1954 because their experience says rallies end badly, rallies end badly. This rally ended badly, this ended badly. So when we're on the right side of a consolidation period and we get a breakout from a long-term consolidation box, it is 100% normal and to be expected that human beings would feel very, very skeptical about the possibility of the market rallying quite a bit further in this direction. And it would be very, very difficult to wrap your arms around or your mind around the fact if somebody told you here, based on your experience, that the market was gonna rally for an additional 18 years, that might've been laughable at this point. So when we're here in 1954 and we get all of this, the consolidation, the low Bollinger bandwidth and the price surge, many investors are still in the, this will end badly mindset, which is basically a long-term form of recency bias. Logically, investors are looking backwards and saying this will end badly based on their experience, what they've seen for the most part in their entire adult life. 
Similar situation in 1984. When we're above the orange box, it's very, very easy to understand why human beings are very, very skeptical. And many were saying this will end badly. This will end badly is based on their experience in the markets. And most market participants do not look at very long-term charts. So when you're here in 1984, this is what the vast majority of market participants are looking at. And this is their real world experience. Very few take the time to understand where are we in the context of the big picture. So let's zoom in on our experience and our lifetime. In 2013, when the market's getting ready to break out of the long-term consolidation box, it's very, very easy to understand why most market participants feel this will end badly. If you were seven years old in 1997, and when you're seven years old, that's when you start picking up things around the house. So if your parents experienced pain in here, if you were seven here, when we get to this point here, you have memories, bad memories about what can happen in the stock market. Similar situation in 1997, if you were 55. If you were age seven in 1997, in 2013, you're 23 years old. And it's totally understandable looking backwards based on your experience that you would be very, very skeptical about the markets. If you were 55 years old in 1997, in 2013, you were 71 years old. So this tells us that the vast majority of market participants, their experience and their recency bias, and recency bias is a fractal as well. It can cover several years. Logically, based on that, they would conclude this will end badly. We've seen this before. And frankly, the further the market moves away from the consolidation box, the more skeptical many investors become in the present day based on their experience. Remember, most investors are not looking back here. They have no idea what took place here. What they know is what they've experienced. And if they look backwards using stock charts, they typically don't look this far back. So it's very, very logical to have the this will end badly mindset. If we fast forward to 2018, if you were age seven in 1997, you're 28 today. If you were 55 in 1997, you're 76 years old today. Again, the vast majority of market participants, this is all they know. They have no idea what happened back here. Therefore, it's not surprising that Market Watch published an article on May 9th. More than 60% of investors say stocks will peak in 2018 if they haven't already peaked. That concept is very, very easy to understand when we understand where these age groups are today. If you're 28 to 76 years old, Based on your experience, this makes sense. But markets don't operate on shorter term time frames. This may sound like a bold statement, but this is how markets operate in the real world. And frankly, we can't even debate that statement. Why is that? This is a historical chart of how the market has operated in the real world dating back to 1926. And you could make the somewhat tired argument that this is a small sample size. If you trade markets and you understand market fractals, you really know that that's not true because we can find the exact same type of patterns. Harder markets are followed by easier markets. Harder markets are followed by easier markets. Harder markets are followed by easier markets. 
We can find those patterns on daily charts, 60 minute charts, 30 minute charts, five minute charts, and one minute charts. The sample size that we have to help us understand this is how markets work is almost limitless. Think of how many fractals on a one minute time frame we could find like this going back to 1926. And we're making the assumption here in the present day that everybody is investing only in the Dow 30 stocks. If we look at the broad market, it's even easier to understand why 60% of the people that are polled or asked today say this will end badly. We hit resistance, it ended badly. We hit the same level of resistance for the average stock, it ended very badly. We came up to the same level of resistance in 2015. It was very understandable to say at this point, this will end badly. We've seen this before. We've seen this before. And frankly, using this index, the evidence supports that. This does not look good here. However, this is in 2016. If we fast forward to the present day, this is our nimble barge look that we have here. Instead of being rejected at prior resistance, it was somewhat of a head fake. We came up, tested the line again, and eventually closed above it. And in the present day, we remain well above it. But based on the demographics, age seven is 28 today, age 55 in 1997 is 76 today, is very, very easy to understand the skeptical bias. But the facts don't support that bias in their present form. Is it possible that the facts will realign with that bias? Absolutely, positively, yes. But they haven't realigned with that bias yet. In fact, what we have in front of us here, a breakout from a consolidation period that actually starts, if you go back here, I could draw a box around price here, from here to here that goes all the way back to 1982. What we have in front of us today as of May 10th, 2018, aligns with this quote from Market Wizards. The second item is something that Ed Sakota taught me. When a market makes a historic high, it is telling you something. No matter how many people tell you why the market shouldn't be that high or why nothing has changed, the mere fact that price is at a new high tells you something has changed. This is different from this. This is different from this. And this is different from this telling us that something has changed until proven otherwise. If price moves back below these levels here, then our assessment of the probabilities will change. We don't anticipate that or forecast that. And right now, we still have a historic new high telling us something has changed. And we know from past videos and the concept of market fractals tell us that easier markets logically are followed by harder markets. And harder markets logically are typically followed by easier markets, telling us to be open to much better than expected outcomes in the years ahead. That's simply a probabilistic statement based on the facts that we have in hand. If the facts change, then our assessment of the probabilities have to change as well. This is the big picture that we have in hand today. This is a set of facts as of May 10th, 2018. Let's zoom in on the two bullish periods here and compare them to the present day. This is the price surge here, the first price surge in 1954. This is the quarterly price surge here at the end of calendar year 1982. 
Notice in the early stages of the secular trend, we tend to hug or stay above the upper Bollinger Band. There's a lot of white space in here. We really don't touch the lower Bollinger Band for several years in here. We don't go into the lower Bollinger Band the entire period. And when the trend starts to wane here, things change. Instead of staying up near the upper Bollinger Band or closing above it on a quarterly basis, now we have white space above the upper Bollinger Band. The Bollinger Band here is rising. This is a bullish trend here. It's moving sideways. This is what the early stages of consolidation looks like. And we also have a very clear momentum divergence in here that we can see before this big plunge. Our center line here is rising, not here. It's flattening out. This is a big yellow flag, red flag in here. This is what a waning trend looks like. We don't have any of that during the entire secular move between the end of 1982 and the end of 1999. We have nothing but white space in the lower Bollinger Band. The slope of the center line for the most part is positive and price remains in the upper Bollinger Band. All of this tells us most likely from a probability perspective, despite the normal and 100% to be expected volatility, most likely this represents a normal pullback within the context of an ongoing uptrend. When we get a look like this, the probabilities start to shift from positive to mixed. And notice here, we don't have any clear momentum divergences like we had here before really bad things happened. How does the present day chart compare to these charts? Does it look like this period here where the trend is starting to wane? Or does it look more like the early stages of a secular trend that eventually was followed by gains for several years? If we look at the exact same chart as of May 10th, 2018, the answer is easy. Price has stayed clearly in the upper Bollinger Band and or above it above the band, strong, above the band, strong, above the band, strong, weak, yellow flags, strong, 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 strong. We don't have anything with this rolling over or white space for a long period of time between price and the band. We don't have a momentum divergence. So when price peaked here, there's no divergence at all. In fact, if anything, momentum confirmed this. This is the highest high here in this run. Even with the volatility year to date, we still haven't given up the upper Bollinger Band. To get concerned, we have to start moving towards the center line and really having the center line have somewhat of a rollover look. How long will this look last? We have no idea. We take it day by day. We're not using these charts to forecast. We're simply using them to monitor the market's present day risk reward profile, which remains constructive given what we know today. We'll wake up tomorrow with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. It may also be worth a visit to the new website to see the FAQs. We've got new and expanded FAQs covering traditional investing, low cost passive investing, and the online slash robo strategies that are currently in vogue.
The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.